And then John, if you could come here and gaze into the camera, which is that one there. <laughs> come over here. Yeah. And don't act like you're scared. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here from the Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW Madison Science Alliance. Thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight it's my pleasure to introduce to you John Ralph. He's a professor in the Department of Bacteria too biochemistry, and he's also with the Wisconsin Energy Institute. John, I'm going to ask you the five questions. Yeah, don't worry. Where were you born? <laughs> uh, New Zealand. Uh, you'll tell by the quaint accent. <laughs> Where in New Zealand? Yeah, but I'd like to say I'm from the South Island, but I was actually born in the North, Foxton. Never heard of it. Yeah, we, we can't say that on TV. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> It's going to be a long and night. You, it's going to be a great night. Where did you go to high school? Uh, high school? Waimea College. Nice. Is that by Waimea Bay? No. <laughs> Hence the name. Where did you go to uh, for undergrad and went to study? Undergrad, I went to Canterbury University in Christchurch, New Zealand. What did you study? Oh, chemistry. Sorry. Good. And then where did you go for your advanced degrees? In right here. Really? Yeah. Is it biochemistry? No, uh, forestry chemistry. Forestry chemistry. Yeah, a very strange hybrid. Did you see the chemicals for the forest? Something like that. So tonight we're going to talk about this cool thing called lignin. <laughs> so for all of us who did their botany 40 or 50 years ago, like Eric and me, lignin was, oh, that was a good five or <laughs> six minutes of lecture. And people said, we don't really know what's going on here. So when you agreed to give this talk, I was really thrilled because it's going to be fun to see what's up with lignin. Would you please join me in welcoming John Ralph for Wednesday Night at the Lab. All right, thanks. Well, hold on. For the next uh, four and a half hours, I'm going to talk to you about <laughs> this rather intriguing poll. <laughs> what, what did you say? Oh. <laughs> and uh, some of the fun surrounding it, or at least I hope it's fun. Uh, if you believe what's been written just recently, or somewhat recently, you might think that the end of the earth is near, that chemistry and physics has gone out the window, and uh, we're in for dire times. I'll tell you more about the controversies in a bit. The lignin itself, it's in all these trees, it's part of what, can I take some? It's part of what helped plants crawl out of the aqueous environment onto the land in the early days, and it's what helps them grow tall and so on. Now, it reinforces the cell wall, the thing in the middle, and uh, transports water and protects the plant as, as well as provides strength. There's a lot of it around. There's 15 to 30 percent of all plant biomass is lignin. As such, it's over quoted as being the second most abundant terrestrial polymer. So why haven't you heard of it? Good question. It's surrounded in controversy. So why haven't you heard of that? <laughs> Again, there's a lot of it. Photosynthesis on this planet produces 20 gigatons of lignin a year. It's a large part of woods, hardwoods and softwoods, 33% or whatever. But the problem with it is, is it's not that it's a fraction, it's that it provides a lot of the recalcitrants, the difficulty of dealing with um, getting at the polysaccharides that you want to make sugars for fermentation to biofuels, for example, or for pulp and paper. Pulp and paper, for example, is quite energy intensive. It requires 170 degree conditions in caustic soda for a few hours. So what do we do with it right now? Basically that. Burning it does have value. It provides energy for the process and allows you to distill your ethanol off or whatever, for example. And it's a way of recovering chemicals in the pulp mill. It's a bit of a pain, but it's also the largest source of sustainably produced aromatic compounds on this planet. So a few things about it. First, it's synthesized from these three monolignols that just differ in their degree of methoxylation. Uh, coniferyl alcohol and synaphyl alcohol, the main ones, with zero, one, and two methoxyls on them. Those things are synthesized inside the living cell, and then they get to the cell wall where they're polymerized into lignin. And that's the part where the fun begins. So in terms of plants uh, on this planet, 
that evolved some time ago, around 200 million years ago, gymnosperms evolved. They had a lignin made only from kinephil alcohol, just from one of those monomers. Later in evolution, you get the hardwoods, dicots, and they decided to put another methoxyl on. By the way, we, we still don't know why plants thought that was a good idea or what evolutionary advantage it gives them. We, we literally have no idea. But it decided to do that. And why is a mystery? But it's more of a mystery when you look back further in evolution, the Saladinella, a lycophyte way back 450 million years ago, had also already decided to do that. Evolution forgot and reinvented it much later. Again, no idea why. Grasses, just to complete the story, deci decided. <laughs> I, I anthropomorphize quite a lot. Uh, plants don't decide anything, they react. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> plants, uh, grasses decided to esterify or to put uh, uh, acids on the alcohol at the top of that monolignol and use that as part of the monolignol, part of the monomer complement. All right. So, what could be controversial about a polymer that's produced by the ton, by the gigaton, and has been studied for a century? Well, if you listen to some people describe it, what it means is that some 20% of the plant's terrestrial biomass is realized in a haphazard manner. We'll go into this in a minute. It's left essentially to chance. What? It has no counterpart elsewhere in biochemistry. That's very striking if that's true. Such claims those claims, if ever shown to be correct, would place lignin formation, nature's second most abundant polymer, no less, with no biochemical equivalent of any kind. Yikes. Part of that came from the history, but part of it came from the fact that some idiots in a lab not far away from here put out some crazy ideas. We introduced the following notions one year that a plant maybe simply needs a polymer with the required properties and that the, its composition wasn't particularly important. We notice that plants can survive by instantly changing, producing different polymers when you stop them producing the monomers that they're trying to produce and it's instantaneous. So the fact that they can do that makes it interesting. Plants can apparently utilize other available phenolics to produce that polymer. And what we realize is this plasticity affords plants, of course, but and us rather enormous potential to modify the lignin. And that's where research is heading these days. The response, though, <laughs> was along these lines. Such hypotheses, if ever widely accepted, would drastically change the current perceptions of how macromolecular cell wall assembly might be attained. And accordingly, also the strategies to employ for achieving numerous biotechnological goals. Well written, as you might see, eloquent, in fact turned out to be delightfully prophetic. They were trying to ridicule us, and it turns out this is exactly where we stand today. <laughs> today, it's rather universally accepted that lignification is metabolically plastic, and that to some degree, we can tune or perhaps even design lignans to our own ends. Uh, good idea to always respect nature and take cues from it. Uh, you'll get surprised. You think you've taught it something really neat, and it'll come back and uh, tell you, no, I did that a few million years ago. We do have to get into the theory just a little, sorry. So the current theory of lignification and the one that was a problem for these people was that lignification, the process of polymerization itself is involves radical coupling of phenols. So for example, from this coniferal alcohol, what we do is we make a radical from it. There's a simple enzyme system can do that in plants, peroxidases and lacases. And this radical is so-called electron delocalized but those five structures you see there are only for us to understand where that electron density re resides, right? So we can understand now how the coupling occurs at various sites on that monomer. These are, these are all of the same phenolic radical. So there is only one. So lignin's radical, nice. The coupling step I do have to go into as well because it has some ramifications that we'll see in a minute. So the way it occurs, you make the radical from the two ends, the, the monomer and the polymer piece. The polymer is represented by the, the, the generic phenolic on the right. And you take one electron from the monomer, you push it around, it loves to couple from its beta position for whatever reason. That's one of those positions where that radical single electron density can reside. And you take an electron from the other guy, and the two electrons make a new bond, and this makes that 
bond and dark over there. And so this is called a beta O4 bond or beta O4 coupling. This guy on the right could also decide, no, I'm going to push my electrons around to the top and I'm going to make a beta-5 product. So this is the combinatorial part of that. It's uh, statistically determined, energetically determined, of course, and there's no defined way in which those two things have to couple in any regular order. There's more to it. <laughs> Not only after the coupling do you create that new bond, but you create a new chiral center. The chiral center is one where the carbon has four different substituents on it such that the mirror image of it is non-superimposable, like your right and left hand. That has some implications too, but we know that the lignin polymer has no optical activity. So that suggests that this is a chemical reaction, not a biologically controlled one. Any biological reaction performed by enzymes or whatever would make that chiral center and make just one of those. Very difficult to make two different chiral centers. Then you add water to re the bottom of this thing, and you end up with another chiral center. Again, lignin's not chiral. It has no optical activity, so that has to be just a purely chemical reaction as well. The ramifications are coming. <laughs> it's a racemic polymer. I get back to it. First of all, I want to justify why certain people thought they needed a new theory. According to these old investigators, Freudenberg back, the only enzymatic control of the lignin assembly involved free radical generation from the monolignols with the subsequent coupling of those monolignols to make the polymer occurring non-enzymatically. That's exactly what it did say. The supposition represented departure. Mm -hmm. And recent progress, <laughs> yeah, that's a bit strange. Recent progress, obviously in our lab, these people, has provided crucial evidence to support the theory that lignin primary structure, in other words, the sequence of units and the stereochemistry of each of those units is controlled at the protein by proteins, by proteins or enzymes. I hope that gives you a start. There's a new theory now. When you have an idea, it's great to put it out there to be tested and so on, but you don't declare your idea to be a new theory. It's a hypothesis. The theory comes after it's assigned to be a theory by other people testing out, peeking, uh, <laughs> prodding and testing your, your hypothesis to see if it fits all the available facts. They've declared it to be a new theory. Okay, what is this theory? God, I hate to spend time describing this. <laughs> they discovered, and it was a, a wonderful discovery, they discovered a protein that takes two of these monolignols and couples them together in a specific way and makes one of those isomers, the right hand, let's say. Very, very nice piece of work. Also nice, they hypothesize that these things have to be involved in lignification too. It's the same kind of reactions. Must be involved in lignification and therefore lignin must be controlled by polymers. Then they realized they need a heck of a lot of proteins to do that. So they decided instead, we'll put these dirigent sites, these sites that attract radicals and help them couple together on a protein. We'll bring up the radicals and bind them to this in such a way that they have to couple to make the structure of it. I've intended it to make. That's great. And then they decided, okay, that chain that you've just made will be a template whereby you bring up a new set of radicals and you make the new, the new polymer, presumably exactly the same, sort of like RNA or DNA. Wonderful. Popular press buys it. The discovery of proteins that guide phenolic radical coupling debunks decades old notions in this field. Really? Uh, we talked to them. Unfortunately, then they talked back to the original theory people and didn't talk back to us. So the next week they reconsidered though, but got confused and decided, okay, to heck with it. We don't care. Uh, at some point, one of these theories will prevail and we'll just let it happen. So that's too bad. <laughs> theory or hypothesis. So they were smart, or I don't know what, uh, they contended that they, the, the current theory, the existing theory, was, a, was an unproven working hypothesis. The current theory was denigrated to be that. Unilaterally raised their own hypothesis to theory status. And at, around that time, Alan Lishner, the editor of Science, was getting a bit nervous about these kind of things happening and put out an editorial and made it very clear what we mean by theory and science. 
There's important it's distinction between a belief and a theory. Scientific theories attempt to explain what can be observed. It's essential they be testable by repeatable observations and experimental experimentation. They have to fit all the available facts. And beautifully, we don't believe theories. We accept or reject them based on their ability to explain the facts. Beautiful statement. Uh, to cut to the chase, there was a wonderful meeting in Winnipeg in Canada where they got to present their side, we got to present our side. It was quite a, a litigation, I guess, of the two sides. Uh, resulted in then a book chapter um, that we submitted to this lovely book. They were supposed to submit a book chapter as well to go alongside this chapter and never did submit it. So it got held up for more than a year, but uh, no chapter was ever seen. All I'll say, and we'll show some more of the evidence coming up, but there really is only one theory for lignification. The challenge theory, this dirigent idea, failed to displace the original. No observations are in fact incompatible with the original theory. There's no supporting evidence for the new theory. <laughs> and it's extremely difficult to explain known features of lignification. So that should be the end of it, sort of is. <laughs> Let me explain some of those bits. I mentioned that it was intriguing that lignans are racemic. This means not much to most of us and not much to chemists, surprisingly. People don't get what this means. Let me show you what it means. You can create a model of lignin, it doesn't matter. It's just some, some model, it's got 20 units in it. You piece it together, obeying all the rules, all the structures are correct and so on for the polymer. But what you realize in that polymer is that you've got 38 optical centers. You did 19 couplings, each one of them generating two optical centers. So there's two to the 38 optical isomers. A few of those are fixed relative to each other. So there's actually a few less. It's two to the 35 actually in that particular structure drawn and half that number then of real distinct physical isomers. Hey Siri, what's two to the power of 34? <laughs> raised to the 34th power is 17,179,869,184. There are 17 billion ways of putting that molecule together. 17 billion different molecules with that exact structure that I drew. <laughs> we got ridiculed for that. There aren't that many genes or enzymes on the planet, they said. Exactly. Nothing to do with enzymes. <laughs> it's a chemical process. All right. So, yeah, here's the ridicule. For example, unproven assertions were made that a lignin ch chain composed of 20 monomers has over 17 billion possible isomers. Such unproven assertions beg the question as to how much longer such extravagant check claims will continue to be made. As long as that's true. <laughs> uh, every first year organic chemist knows how you calculate the number of isomers from two to the n, where n is the number of optical centers. It's sorry, it's a well-known fact. We probably should have known these things from earlier. The proton NMR spectra of lignans are really surprisingly broad and featureless. It was always thought that was because of the molecular weight being quite high, but it turns out the molecular weight of these things is only two or 3,000 here. And look at a 24,000 protein just above it. Every single peak in that is sharp. That's nothing like what the lignin is. Everything is broad. The whole reason is because no two environments are the same. No two molecules in that sample are the same. They're all different. And that's what leads to the, the different Shifts. Okay, so what do you do then? Okay, well, next then, you have a bit of a problem. So you have to cast doubt on this idea that lignin is not optically active in the first place, right? So the apparent lack of optical activity, uh, the perceived lack, the reputed lack, the reported lack, lignins are thought to be racemic and the presumed lack. Uh, we had to document those because they then claimed that they never implied that, that of course they knew lignin wasn't optically active. Well, no, they didn't. This is from their literature. So we took the time to prove yet again that they were not optically active. And, and then they responded by saying, yes, although the questions of lack of, lack of optical activity in lignin formation has already been carefully addressed by ourselves and others. When you look carefully, they did bring up an idea. It could be that there are two distinct type of proteins, each one in code being the opposite isomer. Mm, that's possible. Problem is, how do you get racemic lignin? How do you get something where everything balances? You, what they're suggesting is you have proteins engendering the opposite isomers. Well, that's great. 
but you can't make the opposite isomer of a protein. You only have L amino acids to make your protein from. So what you have to do is you have to make a different protein. If you make a different protein, the kinetics are gonna be different and you have to arrange them to be the right concentration in time and space to balance those two things. And by the way, that's not a 50-50 either. If the kinetics are different, you might have to decide, the plant has to decide, I have to put 60% of this one in and 40% of the other one. Anyway, uh, gets very convoluted. Another problem is that if you make a model, it's just a model, but of a cell wall, where Lubo Jurasek did this from, um, uh, yeah, uh, McGill University, you lay down the cellulose first, you lay down the hemicelluloses. This is what, gets lignified into in the cell wall. The, the polysaccharides are laid down first and the monomers come in and you lignify into that cell wall. So the lignification goes there. And as you can probably see, good luck getting a protein in there to be a template, let alone having one molecule there, be a template for the next molecule and so on. There's, there's just not room to do all that. All right. For a lignin not to be optically active, another dirigent protein in which all those dirigent sites have to engender the opposite, uh, an antimus is required. And I just ask, is that even remotely likely? Uh, I'm sure it's coming to your mind, Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is usually the correct one. <laughs> so is it more logical to conclude that lignification is a simple chemical combinatorial process or that it's a carefully controlled biochemical process with enzymes and proteins for every kind of structure that you expect to get in lignin for all of those coupling modes to exquisitely produce the same racemic polymers that you get from an uncontrolled coupling. Your choice. I love the way uh, Isaac Newton used to say things too. Uh, used to say things too, of course. <laughs> You can read the top part, but I, I love the bottom bit. Nature does nothing in vain, and more is in vain when less will serve. For nature is pleased, pleased with simplicity and affects not the pomp of superfluous causes. So the way we describe lignification now is we take the monomers, we recognize that you make radicals from them, that these can couple combinatorial at various positions, you take the growing polymer, it looks sort of like that. You realize it can couple at various positions and you throw those things together and make a gamish in which you cannot sequence a lignin chain. Well, you could sequence one in principle, right? But no two are the same. So sequencing just doesn't mean anything for lignin, unlike what it means for proteins or DNA or whatever. You can, of course, characterize the relative amounts of each of these kinds of units in the polymer. All right, so the bad part about lignin <laughs> is that there are these billions of isomers, billions of structures. By the way, <laughs> one person asked me a while back, could you send me a, a structure for lignin? I want to model it. I said, uh, which of the you know, 17 billion do you, do you want to model? <laughs> um, uh, it was lost, never mind. Uh, billions of isomers. Compositionally, there's lots of authentic monomers. Uh, structurally, of course, it's complex because of that. But lignification, the process of that polymerization is dead simple. It's one reaction. You make radicals and you let them couple chemically. Fantastic. Don't need any enzymes or proteins, unlike for all kinds of other more complex things. And so the other thing is you might imagine that it's metabolically plastic. Does it care? If, if the component you send to the wall is compatible with that chemistry, then maybe you can do something, you can do lignification with it, uh, metabolically plastic in that sense. All right. Let's assume there is a problem with lignin, and there is. It's difficult to deal with. How do you deal with it? Sorry, this is, I'm artistically challenged. This is not supposed to be a dog. <laughs> this is the preferred pathway down to this coniferal alcohol and synapal alcohol, those monolignols that's been worked out over years, and it's slightly simplified. We, the point is we know all those enzymes and all those genes in that pathway. If lignin's a problem, why don't we just get rid of it? There's a problem, sort of that, but actually sort of that. <laughs> uh, plants do not like you to get rid of their lignin. They need that for all kinds of, of reasons, uh, water transport and everything else. One way you can understand what kinds of reactions you can get is to start perturbing lignin. There's some nice natural ways to perturb it, uh, including these, and there's some 
natural but distinctly less natural ways that you might also perturb the system and see what the plant does in response. I don't know who thought of that one, by the way. Uh, there's the other way, using these really ugly genetic engineers, oh, terrible people, that go in and prod and, and peek and prod at the various genes in the pathway. The pathway is a bit like an electronic circuit. Remember in the old days, you, you change the resistor and so on and see, so see what happens to the output. In the same way, you've got a plant system, you can upregulate genes, you can downregulate genes, or you can completely knock them out and see what the response that the plant gives to that circuit. And when you do that, you can, you've invented genetic engineering of plants, of course, and you can make all kinds of weird and wonderful plants, including some that have quite nice coloring to them. Sub theme here is how to exploit is a word I, I don't like here, but how, how can we make use of the information that we get from prodding genes? We've been really lucky to work in this area with a lot of good people in our lab, a lot of collaborators um, on a problem that's become, or a, a, a focus of work that's become increasingly interesting actually. And I'm certainly not gonna tell you about all these advances. We've also been lucky enough to get a lot of cover articles. Uh, that's always nice goes on your wall and people feel good about that. And occasionally you can make a cover article that has some topical relevance. These scientists are wearing COVID masks today on the cover of this article recently. Back to the dog. So one example, there's a, there's a hydroxylase here that gets you from this coniferal alcohol with one methoxyl to synaphyl alcohol with two. And it's it, the, the reaction, it puts the hydroxyl on before it gets methylated and along the way. That one gene has striking effects on what happens to lignin. The wild type poplar is a two to one S to G, this syringal. This is with the two methoxyls on it, the coniferal alcohol with one methoxyl on it, two to one. If you knock out F5H, you get 100% G, it can't make the S, doesn't do that hydroxylation, can't get there. The striking thing is, if you crank up that gene, you get almost 100% S. I say striking, we were not expecting that because nature does nothing close to that. And these plants in the greenhouse and in the field are indistinguishable from the controls, the wild type. So the plant doesn't seem to mind you're manipulating the, its monomers that way. You grow them in the field, I run these, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to explain lovely NMR spectra, they're fingerprints of the structure and I, I wish I, yeah. We, there's some amazing new techniques for, for doing NMR of whole plant materials and so on now that didn't exist before. But if you look at the NMR of these, this thing has 98% syringal units, just a trace of glycine units. And so a very, very different um, lignin than normal. Question again is, has nature done this better? It gets close. Canaf and Madrone, I'm sorry, I don't know much about Madrone. Uh, it's about seven to one, but our poplar and Arabidopsis are, let's say 50 to one. We're, we're dividing by a very small number there. So it might be 40 to one, it could be 80 to one. I have no idea, but anyway, a uh, uh, very much higher number anyway. And the question would be then, why, why do you want to do better than nature? Isn't it doing all right by itself? Part of the reason is the syringal lignin is very linear. It has more of these beta ethers in them that are the things that you like to cleave off from the polymer to get rid of the lignin when you're pulping, for example. So if you take wild type material and you take the uh, high syringal transgenic material, pulp them under the same conditions, you can see that you've removed a great deal more of the lignin from the high syringal material. Needs a lot less bleaching, needs you could get the same degree of delignification by using milder conditions and save a lot of energy. If we had those plants around 100 years ago before we started pulping plant material, more than 100 years, uh, we would have saved so much energy and so much pollution and all kinds of stuff didn't exist. Too bad. You can also convert lignins into useful monomers by cracking them up and making um, simple aromatic compounds out of them. So for example, if you take a normal lignin and crack it up, you get an array of polymers, uh, sorry, array of monomers by cleaving these beta ethers. But if you take a high syringal polymer, very linear by the way, you get a much reduced uh, set of monomer monomeric compounds. And in fact, if you choose a catalyst, right, you can get this one compound in close to 90% yield. So this becomes really useful for this kind of work trying to get 
simple array of monomeric compounds out of something as complex as lignin. And so in this particular case, we got 78% yield of lignin, uh, sorry, of monomers from, from that high S lignin. 78% yield. I think no one would have assumed you could ever get that kind of yield of monomers from something as hopeless to work with as lignin. Uh, the standard plant, 46% beside it. The more important thing is that's a mixture of those two sets of compounds. This is all syringal. So um, it really is a, an eye-opening way of dealing with trying to get simple chemicals from a really complex polymer. So very useful. You using the normal monomers, you're doing normal lignification, but you're pushing nature a bit to your advantage. All right. So that's great. <laughs> can you, so you can manipulate the levels of the normal monomers. Can you use non monomers, non monolignols? What about the pathway intermediates? What about compounds on the way to making those monomers? So the last step in the pathway, takes an aldehyde to the alcohol. It's a simple reduction step. And if you knock out that gene, you presumably get stuck with those aldehydes, right? You can't make these alcohol monomers. You interestingly get a nice red wood. And part of the excitement comes from the fact that chemists know they can do all kinds of wonderful chemistry on aldehydes. So this potentially makes a beautiful material that the possibilities are open-ended. I'll show you this one in alfalfa, uh, just to be different from poplar for a second. These are two CAD mutants. So they're mutants with that gene knocked out. They don't have that ability to reduce. They look perfectly normal, but the lignans are very different. So the wild type has a syringal guaiacyl lignin, very little syringal actually, but syringal guaiacyl lignin. The CAD deficient one, you have to look a bit closely, but it actually has no S, no G, and everything is derived from those aldehyde units over at the side. So this is nothing like we've ever seen before. The lignin is 95% derived from something that is not a normal lignin monomer. Another one of the comments from these nice people. <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't put their names up. You noticed that, by the way. Uh, you can look them up if you want. There is no known precedent for the free interchange of monomeric units in any biopolymer assembly, then or now, then or now. <laughs> Furthermore, <laughs> they said a few years later after we'd been proving to them that other monomers are being used, that <coughs> all claims, claims of non-lignin monomers acting as lignin monomer surrogates have now been unequivocally disproved. <laughs> I'd love to see that proof. I don't know where that is. All you can do is this. Um, sorry. The, obviously, hydroxycinnamaldehydes, these precursors to the monolignols, are being substituted for mono, monomers. Please note what's happening. The plant has said, holy crap, I can't make my lignin monomers anymore. I'll just have to die then. No, it, it thinks. <laughs> I can apparently get to the aldehydes. I'll send these out to the wall and see if we can make a good polymer of that and allow me to survive. This might remind you of something. You know, I know where I'm going with this one. <laughs> What's his name? Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park. Life uh, finds a way. <laughs> Plants don't just keel over because you get rid of a gene to make what's presumably a crucial product for them, a crucial monomer for them. All right. <laughs> About this point, you've got enough data to realize that you can start thinking about what might be an ideal lignin for a biorefinery. What would make an ideal lignin to process it as well as you process, you know, the cellulose, the carbohydrates, for example. Some really clever guys in the lab came up with these three as a as a one possibility. Minimized type of lignin subunits would be nice, not S and G, but just S, for example contain only CO bonds. Boy, that would be nice because we can cleave those. We could make monomers out of all those if we made only that bond. How? Can't imagine. Wouldn't it be nice, we won't go into this, if it was acid resistant. A lot of the pretreatment you do to biomass is acid-based pretreatment that allows you to get at the carbohydrates and get that lignin out of the way or make the uh, polysaccharides accessible to enzymes to make sugars from, for example. So we won't go into that. But Nature might have actually already provided an example. What is it? What is it? <laughs> it's van vanilla. 
If you look at the lignin in the stems, there's nothing special about it. It's a GS lignin, different method, sorry, didn't use NMR in this case. It makes a GS lignin the same as any old other plant does. But if you look in the seed coats, it makes a lignin from something else that we hadn't seen before, and it's cafeal alcohol. So this is coniferal alcohol that didn't get methylated. So another one of those cases where it didn't quite get through the pathway. What we didn't expect from that, but what happens in vitro or in vivo, so what that compound likes to do is couple in just one way. So although in principle you could couple it combinatorially, again, it makes an almost perfectly linear homogeneous polymer like this. That makes it much nicer to make lignin fiber, for example, from instead of the normal lignin that's a big fat mess again. So very interesting already in that sense. It has minimum type of subunits. It's just from cafe alcohol. It contains only CO bonds. Might not look like it, but it, that's what it does. They are only CO bonds between each unit. And because actually it doesn't have a benzylic OH, it's uh, acid resistant as well. You can throw this stuff in concentrated sulfuric acid and it doesn't, nothing happens to it. Very cool. All right. So when you hydrogenalize this now, you convert it to monomers. I'm sorry, I wasn't trying to pull something on you here. The, the high is only 68% here, and I said it was 78 before. Sorry, it's a different process, but never mind. You can call that 78 if you want still. But the C lignin gave 89% yield of monomers from that. Uh, they're C only. Basically, you're getting a 90% yield of a compound that's night or of a mixture, a set of monomers that's just one compound in roughly 90% uh, uh, amount as well. So again, you're pushing up what you can do from a lignin, a complex polymer like lignin and get really cool products out of it and very high yield. Nature has made this C lignin. Uh, we haven't. <laughs> so far we failed. Uh, that work is still ongoing, of course. All right, next. <laughs> First new seed box. Uh, I'm going to talk about, we started to a little bit with those hydrogenolysis products, but useful products that you can make from lignans, because right now, just about everything we make is from fossil fuels. You're aware of that. We recently got a fair bit of press actually in the local papers, but all across the world for making Tylenol from biomass. Hmm, that's interesting. Why? By the way, sorry, I'm missing a slide or something. Never no, doesn't matter. We, we thought of a fairly cool headline to put with this. Relieving two headaches with one process. We're thinking about relieving the headache of dealing with lignin, making something useful from it and getting value from it. And also, of course, the pain reliever sense. What you can't know is how they're going to use that headline. And unfortunately, they juxtaposed it with our pictures, <laughs> <laughs> causing our dear leader to say, are these the two headaches you're talking about? <laughs> Thank you, Tim. <laughs> What this is about is poplar and other plants have parahydroxybenzoic acid stuck on their lignans. We know how it gets there now. We've got genes for that, all kinds of things. Uh, but we look at that and we realize what Tylenol is and we think, hmm, that's not so far away. Maybe we can make Tylenol from these parahydroxybenzoic groups. The way Tylenol is made right now from coal tar or fossil fuel is you take them all the way down to benzene first. And then you have to spend three reactions to get that hydroxyl on. After that, and by the way, those three reactions each require a reaction tower and distillation tower and everything else to do the purification. Then you, uh, sorry, you nitrate it, but you get two compounds in that. You can only use one of them. So you take one across, you reduce this thing, and then you finally acetylate it. As you might imagine from our process, we start with these parahydroxybenzoates. You throw the poplar material in ammonia and you get this amide. And there's a beautiful little rearrangement that's very old actually and looks a bit magic, but a Hoffman rearrangement that takes this, this amide and takes it to the, the nitrogen on the ring. Um, that compound itself is a commodity chemical that's used or sold around the world in very high volume. Um, but then to uh, make Tylenol again, you simply acetylate. So if you saw this today and you didn't have reserves of fossil fuels or anything, and you wanted to think, how am I going to make Tylenol? You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't conceive of doing it the old way, right? You wouldn't think of starting from benzene. So ah, dang it. <laughs> making Tylenol per se is not that significant, honestly. 
at some point though, we've got to stop using fossil fuels. That point was probably 25 years ago. This represents one of many examples of nice ways to make sustainable and make uh, commodity chemicals in a sustainable way. And it also points out how short-sighted it is not to use the, the substitution that nature's already given us. Half, half of what we do with these fossil fuels is we go put that substitution back on. Which leads me to one of the things that really grinds my gears. Uh, apart from the other thing that grinds his gears, uh, um, companies kept telling us, look, you've got this aromatic lignin. We want you to give us the benzene, toluene, and ethanol that we can put right in at the beginning of our process and just push it right into our supply line. Good reason for that. They have a very successful model. They don't have to do anything if we could do that. But it turns out really hard to get down to that by taking all that functionality off. And all I can say is how freaking idiotic is it to not be exploiting again that substitution that nature's given us, most of which we use in the kinds of compounds that we're, we're making from commodity chemicals. I would argue too, the compounds we get from hydrogenolysis, for example, or from oxidation, if we had started with those as raw materials, we'd have a huge plastics industry and everything else based on those compounds instead of, hydro, uh, instead of the fossil derived compounds. All right. This is a point at which you start to get a little bit, um, yeah, you start to get a little bit cocky. And you're thinking about, okay, I've seen nature do all these things. That's very nice. Can we teach it something new? And we had a good idea uh, quite some time ago. Actually, it took a long time to realize this one, but let me tell you about this one. The idea is, well, normal old poplar lignin. It has a whole bunch of strong bonds in it. The weakest bonds are these beta ethers, but they still need that 170 degrees in caustic soda, for example, right? Wouldn't it be neat if we could put more readily cleavable bonds into the backbone of the polymer? We've symbolized it with these little twist ties here as opposed to the steel bonds. Wouldn't it be cool if we could do that? Because then we could get the lignin out of the way, depolymerize it, get it out of the way much more easily. Back to the dog thing. So our, our idea <laughs> is either gonna look to you as being unbelievably clever, unbelievably stupid, or unbelievably obvious, and all three can occur to you <laughs> and have to people who have uh, critiqued us or whatever. We realized these monomers we're trying to produce again, coniferol and synaphyl alcohol. But up in the pathway, there's an activated intermediate that if we could couple that together, we could make these monomer conjugates with this frulate in the pathway, uh, up in the pathway, as part of a monomer conjugate, sort of like a dimer, but already ready to go. Why, why ferulate? The reason being that we knew a lot about radical coupling of ferulate. It does all the same things that coniferol alcohol, the monolignols do. So it couples in sort of the same way. Artistic challenge warning again coming up. So what you end up doing is you incorporate that whole molecule by polymerizing at both ends into the lignin. But what you realize you've done is you've engineered a readily cleavable bond then into that backbone. And so what you've sort of done is made a polymer that you can really easily pull into pieces. I think it's better on the next slide, which is you know, arguably better. Make a model of this thing. With you, if you put this conjugate in, you can cleave the polymer up in mild base um, compared to the high stringent conditions that you, you would need to, to cleave the normal polymer. And the whole reason that you can do that is because you've engineered these esters into the backbone of the polymer. All right. Won't go into it, but we got the gene that we wanted to put those two pieces together out of Chinese Angelica. We threw it into poplar and also developed a method from another method that was available in the lab for proving not that you just made that conjugate, that, but that it had, had it, it had gone into lignin, that it was being used for lignification. I won't describe that. But to say that we were then seeing these conjugates come out of this transgenic lignin. Great. Good enough to get into science, not good enough to get under the cover. Dang. In that, we said these are plants that are designed for deconstruction. Again, that's great. We can't write our own news. We said designed for deconstruction. The news headline was cheaper fuel from self destructing trees. Oh no. 
And the internet just lit up with people regaling, or regaling us, <laughs> the opposite of that, denigrating us for, I'll be peacefully walking in a national park and these trees, these ge genetically modified trees, no less, are gonna be exploding all around me. Can I assure you that all we've done is put some slightly weaker bonds into the backbone of the polymer. The plant doesn't even notice hardly. Um, and uh, it just makes it fall apart better in hot caustic soda, not a very natural condition. So it, that is not an issue. By the way, we didn't respond to any of those. We just let the, <laughs> let the web thing do itself. These are materials that have lower energy required for processing. I can, yep, we've got a little time to do it. I can prove that uh, wonderful pulping chemists on campus did a really nice pulping study with that genetically modified material. Very boring graph actually, but you pulp to a given kappa level. This is a measure of the lignin that's left in the pulp. And so you always try and pulp to some kappa level that you want, the people want for the paper. And at every level you decide to pulp to, the, the transgenic material uh, is, gives you a two point higher yield or two percent higher yield um, of pulp, the, the cellulose pulp. That's actually worth quite a bit to the, to the mill. It's worth 10 or $20 a ton, just uh, simplistically actually, you know, five to 10 million a year, one or $2 billion a year for the, uh, for the process. And that zip lignin technology then has been licensed. So quite nice. Back to this quote that you can't replace monomers. <laughs> uh, didn't we just do that? Didn't we design a new monomer and induce plants to use it? Didn't plants go ahead and kindly do as we asked? Ooh, great. Nice story, by the way. One of, the, one of the proponents of the opposing theory that came out for a while saw this work and really liked it and supported it. It just shows I you- I get that. Could you try again? Yeah. This shows you the integrity of some scientists. Um, it's just heartwarming to see that actually. So he was, he was swayed by this when it finally came out. So great. Wait, <laughs> any of you notice what I'm about to show you now? Please apply to come and work in our lab. You can work for free, I promise. Did you notice in these pictures, <laughs> wait a minute, the wild type material, is it making those new things you just said you made in the transgenic? Holy cow, it is. These plants, mother nature is already doing what we thought we just taught her. There's a guy in the back of the room that discovered that, did a large uh, phylogenetic study and showed that it's in all grasses, natively, and it's in about half of the hardwoods that we surveyed. It's not in any softwoods. But so nature already decided to do that. We don't know why. Uh, in principle, you could save maybe a couple of steps. You've sort of got a, a monomer that you didn't have to take all the way down to the bottom line. Literally no idea if that's worth anything. So don't know why they're doing that either. A lot of things we don't know. Anyway, there's considerable potential yet to get those levels higher. And we keep uh, endeavoring to do that, of course. All right, the last thing, seriously. <laughs> oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Isn't lignin complex enough? So here's the little phenolic pathways for lignin. And there's a whole bunch of pathways around it. And you're just going, wait, do you have to get your phenolics out of your own pathway? Can you go steal them from somewhere else? That was never known until very recently. Spanish guy in our lab discovered this thing, trison, trison, where is it? Trison, this thing, it's a flavonoid. It's on the lignin in all grasses. It's in corn stover, for gosh sakes. It's always on the end of the polymer. There's a fair bit of it. It's a few percent. It's quite high in oat and wheat and all the rest. Again, a phylogenetic study for that. Inspired by the guy at the room, back of the room again, Steve, by the way, if anyone needs to know. Trison by itself is quite valuable. It's used, it has a bunch of potential uses. It doesn't have those uses on the market because it's so dang expensive that uh, no one has put it on the market. But it's potentially really, really useful. It's so valuable in fact, that when we put it in a table to try and sell it to our funders, it was so embarrassing in the table that we had to cross it out. What? never appeared in there. <laughs> Trison is worth $1.2 million a kilo right now, and it's sitting in a waste product <laughs> from all the mills that are uh, 
All right, uh, coconut shells and so on have hydroxystilbenzene. You've probably never heard of pisiatinol, but resveratrol is a cousin of that. That's the thing that's in red wine that might be the thing that uh, helps French people eat as much fatty food as they want and not gain any weight. Uh, these things are now discovered in lignin. Never known until very recently that these were in lignin. So people, phytochemists, people that are interested in these compounds are suddenly getting a bit interested in lignin. They never have been in the past, but they're suddenly realizing that some of their favorite molecules are in this dang polymer <laughs> that is being made on a massive scale and making their compounds potentially on a massive scale. So of course there are people delving into that now. When you think about what you might want to design with lignin, Lignans that are easier to remove from biomass comes to mind. Homogeneous lignans are a good idea, simple products and useful in their own right. And then these valuable components that you can put into lignin now. And uh, research is going gung-ho in all those directions. Conclusions. All right. Lignification. It's simple. <laughs> now we can design lignans for homogeneity, improved deconstruction, cooperation of valuable co-products. Important point. This is not because we've redefined lignans. <laughs> it's because nature has developed them this way all along. We just didn't know. We didn't know these things were here until recently. Didn't have methods to look for them. Didn't know they were there. And the point is just recently that these things are potentially or right now being incorporated into lignans by the ton. Things that we didn't know were there and are quite valuable. To the extent that we can get them out, next problem, uh, these could be better. Oh, sorry. Uh, Lovely group. This isn't my group now. We've been devastated by COVID, not in a bad way. Sorry, just a lot of people got recalled home, but I like to remember the group this way. Wonderful group of people, and we have marvelous collaborators all over the world that are responsible for a lot of this work, too. Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks for that talk. It's really interesting. Um, I wonder a little bit about um, some below ground stuff. Of course, and <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> um, just kind of your general thoughts. It seems like there's two camps out there in terms of lignin's role in soil decomposition and litter decomposition, and its role perhaps in so carbon sequestration, yeah. what is it? Yeah, so you're right. We're only just now embarking on some of those things. Other people can do it as well, but really, really quite good structurally. We have these structural tools, NMR in particular, for figuring out what's going on. Suberin's the other compound that gets made like lignin and differentiating the two is convoluted sometimes. Anyway, we, we're starting to look. I, I don't mean we're ahead of the game or anything else, but it, you're right. It's very interesting. And the sequestration, carbon sequestration idea is, is coming on strong now. So good time. Yeah, that's all I got to say. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure. Maybe. Does that work? I'm not sure I got it actually. I'm sorry about that. I was slightly, I was trying to disconnect here for a second. Did I do that by the way? Or? No, you're still screen. Oh, geez. What? So, what? What screen sharing? Oh, I leave the meeting. Sorry. Uh, go. The question is about better science storytelling through a ah. press release and how you can do that ah. the next time so you don't have all those failures and you can get to a better place. Yeah, the, the first one we had out actually, we talked about how metabolically plastic lignification was. And a British uh, publication said that uh, Ralph said pretty soon we can use styrene as the monomer and make tr tree trunks out of polystyrene. Uh, so you're right, you get misquoted and misrepresented fairly easily. Um, we found more recently, we tend to work with people and they're happy for us to actually work and edit 
their work. They, they don't like the story to be changed too much, and we understand that. They're very good at writing for the public and making things of much more general interest than we can make them, or I can for sure. Um, and yet they, they really do want to get the story right and not have things uh, go out in a way that really doesn't represent anything. The juxtaposition of our photos, you just, you just laugh that one off. That, that's funny. But when you are yeah, mis misrepresented or the, the idea comes out wrong, um, that's not doing a service to anyone. And most, most um, newspapers and so on recognize that and, and are happy to send it to us these days for, for proofing. Are you finding that too, by the way? Or are you in, <laughs> are you in science communications or something perhaps, or? No, no? okay. No, just a, just a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It can be. We're not good salesmen, or most of us aren't. Um, follow things that we like to see so um, you know if someone tells us that coffee is really good for you I'm I'm gonna read that article <laughs> if it says coffee is really bad for you I, I might not read that one so <laughs> um, it goes yeah it's quite a deep problem actually but I have a couple of questions from ah. the chat um, Raj asks according to the recovery act the Department of Energy mandate is to produce a certain million gallons of biofuel. And I don't think there's any mandate quantifying for the production of biochemicals. Have we given up on biofuels because the economics don't support the emphasis on biofuels? Wow, so that's a nuanced uh, thing. I, I'm not qualified to answer all of that, but the economics, that, that's, that's tragic actually. The idea that we don't subsidize fossil fuels, not true, massively subsidized and always have. If those subsidies came off, a lot of these things could compete. It was never a good idea to go for corn ethanol, corn grain ethanol. It was easy to get ethanol from corn, from starch, very easy to do, very difficult to get it from cellulose. There were something like 50, 35 plants in the US that were designed to get cellulosic ethanol from the plant biomass basically, they've all folded. Honestly, it's, it's tragic. We have to do that. We cannot keep using fuel. So there should actually be an incentive. And um, I, I would like to think there wasn't, there was, an incentive wasn't needed if you took all the subsidies off and if you start figuring in wars and everything else. I mean, the, the cost of using that is high, but the cost of keeping using it is the destruction of this planet. I'm sorry, we, we, we don't have a choice. Uh, now, what was this? <laughs> no, I forgot the real part of the question. Um, yeah, and, and by the way, we, Tylenol, the quick way that we make that, you would think, oh, that's got to be competitive. We're just getting off poplar and we've got a couple of little steps compared to all these steps from the petrochemical process. The scale of that industry is enormous. Billions and billions of gallons of, of benzene are produced, for example. So you, you actually can't compete. But you get close enough that there's enough interest. And I, again, I don't think we have a choice pretty soon. I'm sorry, that was a good answer. <laughs> Raj also asks, is there any study to see the economics of, say, a ton of lignin for power production as opposed to producing chemicals? And also, do these processes produce greenhouse gas emissions? Yep. You burn lignin, you create greenhouse gases. Um, CO2. Um, ideally, of course, you've already sequestered that CO2 by 
making, and making the tree. So at least you're, you're not utilizing carbon that was buried under the ground for millions and millions of years, you know? Um, so, so there's that. Um, yes, burning lignin, as I mentioned, it, it has value. You can feed energy into the grid by doing that right now. Um, there have been papers out um, uh, showing the economics of just burning whole biomass even, it seems to me a tragic waste. <laughs> you're, you're, you're taking a component that you have no other source for naturally, and you're just just burning it. I think we can do better. So I, I don't have a good answer for that, but there are, there, there are studies on that, obviously, obviously. Yeah. Other questions? I wouldn't mind asking, uh, if somebody raises their hand, you can take the microphone. Um, I'm thinking about petroleum. Trees fall down, trees have already got lignin in them long ago in the Carboniferous. How much of the stuff that we're pumping out of the ground is from lignin? I, I took off a slide on that. There was a great theory for a long theory, hypothesis for a long time, that all of our fossil resources were from lignin that was buried in the ground before any organisms had evolved to degrade lignin. So before fungi evolved, all this material could not be degraded, gets into the ground and eventually ends up as oil. I've seen a paper recently that suggests that may not have been quite true, that in, in other words, some of our oil comes from carbohydrates as well, by the way, uh, which for which there were degrading enzymes. Some of it comes from after these fungi evolved, for example. So it's one of those wonderful sounding theories that every everything we, we use is because there was nothing to degrade lignin way back in the early earth. I don't I don't know if that's true anymore. <laughs> Other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thanks.